We're here in Augusta's Capital Park to show you the. You're doing fine, you're doing beep, fine. beep, beep. Start over. Next cut. We're here in Augusta's Capital Park to show you the final and last known resting place of one of Maine's most important early governors. His name was Enoch Lincoln, and those responsible for the perpetual care and maintenance of his grave lost him. I can't see the lettering very well in this, so I don't know if I'm getting it. I'm sure you are, I just can't see it very well on the screen. Anything else right now? Well, we are here at Enoch Lincoln's almost gravesite. We know he was buried here at one point. We don't really know where he is now. I don't think anybody knows where he is now. Um, there is, um, uh, not a conspiracy, but more like a theory that he was buried before the tomb was actually um, uh, the state. Yeah, before this was erected, and before this, um, they were given official permission to build this whole enclosure underneath. So his body might be underneath bodies that are buried inside of this crypt. Yeah. So the crypt is, was built finally, and his body might be under it. That's the best theory that's been um, put forward so far. So today we are at, well we're in Augusta's Capitol Park and this is where Enoch Lincoln is supposed to have been buried. He's uh, Maine's fourth governor and uh, he died really young. As you can see here, I don't know if, you, if I could get this, so if you can't see it, it says Enoch Lincoln of Portland, governor of Maine, died October 8, 9, uh, 1829, aged 40. So he was, he was really young. Most people are just really beginning their their big political plans at age 40. He had already been governor at age 40. He had accomplished so much in his in his life. So it's important that we know where he's buried. And right now, nobody knows where he's buried. This is the last known place that people think he was buried. Enoch Lincoln was born into a politically powerful family in Worcester, Massachusetts in 1788. Both his father, Levi Sr. and his older brother, Levi Jr., had been governors of Massachusetts and held other numerous highly prestigious political positions, including the positions of state representative and lieutenant governor, which is the position that takes over for the governor should the governor become incapacitated or die while in office. By his own right, Enoch was a highly educated and capable individual. He attended Harvard and received an honorary Master of Arts degree from Bowdoin College, after leaving Harvard in 1807, he studied law with brother Levi Jr. and was admitted to the Massachusetts Bar in 1811. In 1815, only four short years after passing the bar, Enoch found himself serving as the assistant U.S. District Attorney, and by 1818 he was elected to the U.S. House of Representatives, a position he held until he ran for Governor of Maine in 1827. In 1827, Lincoln was elected as Maine's sixth governor, and he continued to serve for two additional single-year terms when he was re-elected by winning over 90% of the votes cast. Governor Lincoln was incredibly popular. Enoch Lincoln was clearly a man on the move from the moment he left Harvard. A true political player, but an individual with a wide-reaching range of interests that may have put him ahead of his own time in certain respects. He was an outspoken champion for those in need and people who lacked a figurehead to represent them. As an example, he opposed slavery, had a sincere appreciation for Native American culture, and was a proponent for the education of women during a time such a thing was unheard of. It took many decades for any of these subjects to become strong enough movements to have a social impact, yet Enoch stood strong and vocal for all long before any became popular. Enoch is the reason Maine's capital is Augusta and not Portland. He is also the reason the Capitol building was placed where it stands today, overlooking the near 34 acres of Capitol Park and, at the time the site was chosen, the beautifully sweeping views of the Kennebec River. I'm here at, uh, I'm in Capitol Park. That's the Capitol building right there, Maine's Capitol building. I wanted to give you a little bit of um, kind of a spatial view of what's happening here because you can't really see the river from here. This is where the Capitol building is. I'm going to turn straight around and show you that this is Capitol Park behind me and beyond the end down there where you can see is the river. Um, and that is mentioned in my narrative. 
So back when Enoch Lincoln decided that this is, was, this is the place where the Capitol building was gonna be, he could see clear down to the river. It was beautiful, it is beautiful now. Uh, in fall, at the height of color, Capitol Park in Augusta, Maine is very beautiful. He commissioned Charles Bullfinch to design Maine's new state house in 1827. The same architect responsible for the designs of the U.S. Capitol, Faneuil Hall, and the Massachusetts State House. Lincoln is considered to be Maine's first poet after he published a poem in 1816 called The Village, which earned him that honorary degree from Bowdoin College. One of the most important things Enoch did as governor of Maine was to protect Maine's northernmost boundary when it came under scrutiny by England. They wanted a chunk of our state and the federal government was ready to hand it over, but Enoch stood his ground and held firm there would be no boundary change under his watch, and there wasn't. Finally, in 1829, the year of his early demise, the governor approved the charter for the town of Lincoln, which was named in his honor. Although Enoch Lincoln saw the cornerstone of the new state house building laid on July 4th, 1829, he would pass before it was completed. So this reads, State of Maine, on the 53rd anniversary of the independence of the United States, this cornerstone of a building to be erected for the accommodation of the legislative and executive departments of the government is laid by the Grand Lodge in presence of Enoch Lincoln, Governor, Andrew Jackson, President of the United States, John C. Calhoun, Vice President, John Marshall, Chief Justice, July 4th, 1829. Rededicated on the 160th anniversary. They had to move this stone from the building when they added the wings on. That's pretty cool, so Enoch Lincoln was here. And does this mean that the president and the vice president and the uh, chief justice was here as well? That's pretty cool. If it was Andrew Jackson was here for the dedication of this building. Have to look at that and see. Enoch Lincoln was the first Maine governor to die while in office. He was buried in a vault on the grounds of the new Capitol Park and a prominent granite monument marks his final resting place. The problem is, in 1986, when a work crew entered the vault to do some restoration work, they found it empty. So the question is, where did Enoch Lincoln go? Some say he was buried under the tomb and not in it, because the state legislature didn't approve a monument dedicated to him until 1842. Others say his body was removed during an earlier cleaning of the vault back in the 1950s and never put back for some reason. There's an even older rumor, so old it's nearly been forgotten, that his body was removed from the crypt on purpose to Boston, being reinterred in his home state of Massachusetts. But unless somebody does some digging, we'll never really know for sure. Hey everybody, we are back at my house right now for my favorite part of these videos. Uh, the five things I think you might want to know about Enoch Lincoln. I love telling anecdotes at the end of my videos. Uh, the first thing is that Enoch Lincoln was not married when he died, but he was betrothed to Mary Chadbourne Page, a young lady who lived in Fry Freiburg, which is where he wanted to retire after he, after this his last term as governor. Um, he was asked to run for governor again, and he told people that he was he really wanted to just retire and live, you know, essentially a. A, he was a lawyer, but he wanted to live like a rural life back in, in Freiburg, and Mary was waiting for him. And they had actually been engaged for a few years before he died. They had a wedding date set, and he died before they could, before he made, you know, made it to that date. The second thing I think you might want to know about Enoch Lincoln is that he went to Harvard, but he didn't graduate from Harvard. And the reason why he didn't graduate from Harvard is because he was expelled. Ooh. Um, why was he expelled? He was expelled because he took part in the Rotten Cabbage Rebellion of 1807. Um, I'd like to say that that was the only food-related rebellion that took place at Harvard, but alas, it is not. He, um, he took part in the Rotten, Cab R Rotten Cabbage Rebellion of 1807, but that was actually... Um, 
that was actually at least the second rebellion that had taken place at Harvard. There was the, um, the Great Butter Rebellion of 1766, Behold, Our Butter Stinketh. Uh, yeah, it came out of that one. How bad does your butter have to stink to actually hold a rebellion? Well, anyway, so let's get back to the Cabbage Rebellion. Let me tell you about the Cabbage Rebellion. Cabbage apparently was somewhat of a staple um, for the students at Harvard. And um, so they used to have cabbage stew quite a bit. And of course the cabbage was rotten, um, as the title suggests. But it also had maggots in it. <laughs> so sometimes they'd be eating their soup or their stew. Not only would the cabbage clearly be rotten, but there's maggots floating in their food. So they, uh, the students filed grievances, and then more grievances, and then more grievances, and none of them made a difference. And so they had a giant food fight. A whole bunch of kids got expelled, and he was among the many. Some of them actually, um, I don't know if they appealed the ex, you know, being expelled, some because some of them went back, but not Enoch. Enoch went to work for his brother, or went to study law with his brother, and uh, he wound up being admitted to the bar in 1811. So it didn't really do much for his career one way or the other. But the next thing I think, the third thing I think you might want to know about Enoch Lincoln is that, oh, how do I say this? He once challenged another lawyer in Freiburg to a duel to the death. What? Yes. Uh, Freiburg at the time was known as a fairly wild um, city. I, I don't want to make it sound like, like Wild West wild, but um, it was kind of an oasis in the mountains in the, in the very rural area of Western Maine. I don't know how else to say this. It was like we have a lot of trees and mountains and just um, non... Um, you know, space that's just all nature. And then there's Freiburg. You know, and so um, there's probably a large transient population at the time, and you know, people coming there for services, legal services, as an example. I can't tell you what happened between the lawyer, between him and the other lawyer, but I can tell you that it was fairly serious. And I mean, it's kind of like a character building, um, you know, it, it helps build an image of his character in your mind that he wasn't the kind of guy who was going to get into a bar fight or a fight out on the streets or even just a fight in person. He just wasn't going to do that. He would take his conflict with you and he would take it completely intellectual. But gee whiz, this really ticked him off and he was he it was he just challenged this guy to a gentleman's duel. <laughs> I don't know if the duel happened. There is no documentation that was available to me. I did a deep dive into the internet. I wanted to know what happened with this duel and I could not find anything. If anybody knows what happened with this duel, please write to me because I really, really want to know. I don't think it happened, but you know, who knows? Maybe it did. Um, all right, so let's see here. The fourth thing I think you might want to know about Enoch Lincoln is that... Um, he was ahead of his time in terms of his ability to read and write. Of course, he was a lawyer, he went to college, so we expect certain levels of intellect from him. And um, he published The Village, which was a poem, but it was really long, so it was like a book. So he had, he had experience with writing, he had experience with being published, and then he, want, he had been awarded that Master of Arts degree from Bowdoin. So, and like his work was respected and well known, and he wanted to do more of that. So he had spent years collecting information, um, documents, materials, maps, all kinds of things. Um, that would help him write a book that would tell the history of Maine. So he was in the process of doing that. He was also in the process, and this is fascinating, listen to this, okay? He moved to Freiburg because of um, the interactions that that community had had even most recently to him um, with native populations in the area. Now, it wasn't so recent that it happened when he was there, but it was recent enough that it was in the conscious collective of that town. So while um, it may not have, why the, con 
while the conflict probably didn't happen within the last couple of years, people in the town knew people who were involved in it, knew people who died in it. You know, it was that fresh to them. So they were, the town itself was pretty tense when it came to relations and conflicts or potential conflicts with tribes that were still in the area. And there were tribes that were still in the area. He moved there so that he could study the tribes. So that he, he wasn't studying them as like scientists study, you know, specimens. He wanted to um, immerse himself in the culture. He was fascinated with Native American culture. Okay, so when he died, he had already had this huge collection of, um, you know, a, a lot of the same stuff from main history, but some some additional, spe you know, specific like oral histories as an example. Um, he had a collection of like um, rituals and traditions that he was that he had learned about through different through mingling and spending a lot of intimate time with um, Native American tribes in the area. We're talking from Fr Freiburg all the way up to like the Rangeley in Rangeley Lakes area. I mean, that's quite a distance, especially when you think about. He died in 1829. I mean, it's hard to get, even today, it's hard to get from here to there. Can you, I can't even imagine how difficult it was to get from Freiburg to the Umbagog Lakes in the Rangeley region, which he spent a lot of time up in that area, um, specifically with one specific um, settlement or uh, Indian tribe, I guess, just a very basic like in Indian tribe, and one specific Indian chief, actually. Um, so yeah, so he was in the process of writing a book about Native American culture, but he wanted to share the beauty of their language and their languages, um, as well as their, just their actual, um, like the history of the tribes. <laughs> I don't know if you can hear that, but the neighbor's chickens are going crazy. <laughs> Number five is a little more somber than the rest and far less adventurous. Um, number five is that he knew that he was dying. And um, he knew there was nothing he could do about it. He did not know what was wrong with him. He did not have a diagnosis. He just felt his health declining at what most of us would consider a fairly rapid rate um, in his final year as governor. I, there's so many things, I mean, I could tell, I don't want to fill this video with too much, you know, of this, but in July, when he came to lay the cornerstone for the Capitol building in Augusta, he was not well. Okay, so this is July. He did a lot of his business, and I believe he resided down in Portland, because while Augusta was the Capitol, now it was named the Capitol, um, there weren't any there weren't any government buildings or there weren't that many government buildings and so I think a lot of the business was still being done down in Portland until the until the government buildings were built and moved into up here in Augusta so he was down in Portland in October when he had to come back to Augusta to do a speech at the Coney Female Academy while he was down there in October so he was sick in July he was all he had been sick he went to that cornerstone um, you know, just laying the cornerstone. He went to that ceremony, knew he was really sick then, went back to, to Portland, was sick then the whole time, um, just getting sicker and sicker and sicker. October came around, he was supposed to come up to Augusta, and he did, he came up to Augusta, but before he left, he was so sick, he told his friends and his workmates that he thought that maybe this was the last time that he would ever be in Portland. And, uh, I guess when he said that out loud, the entire room went silent. Nobody knew what to say. Nobody knew what to say. I mean, they all saw his degradation since July, and, um, you know, it worried everybody. And he told them, he said, I'm, I'm getting weaker. I, I feel my strength leaving my body. I don't think I'm coming back. I don't, I don't think I'll ever see this place again. And um, so they asked him, well, you want to stay? Maybe you shouldn't leave. And he said, no, I have to do this. So they went up to Augusta. When they got to Augusta, they got to the place, well, they got to um, the place where he was going to do the speech for the, for the girls at the school. And somebody tried to get him to not do it. They told him, you're too sick. You're obviously weak. We have to get you someplace so that you can rest. And we'll do it another day. And he said, no, we have to do it. We have to do it now. We have to do it today. And um, let me... 
let me tell you why it was important to him. It was important to him because his mother was a very strong influence in his life, especially his educational life. His mother had a lot to do with his education at the beginning, which meant that she was capable, right? She was capable of teaching him certain things, um, things that women aren't necessarily expected to be able to teach anybody. His mother taught him these things. And his mother instilled in him this vision that women can do anything intellectual that men can do. They just have to have the opportunity to be taught how to do these things and then they can go, you know, and, and either carry on or they can teach others. And it really was, I don't know if it was a rarity, but boys went to school more than girls went to school and school wasn't even mandatory. So you had to really have a reason to have a girl's school. A girl's school was a celebration in a community because girls are in school, like yes. Um, another aspect of his, this situation is that he was a celebrity. He was the biggest celebrity in the state. I want to qualify this by saying that they, this is, when I'm doing this video, it's 2022, right? You're in 1820, put yourself in 1829, there's no internet, you're watching this on YouTube. There's no influencers, there's no internet, there's no YouTube, there's no radio, there's no television. There, there's no celebrity, there's no movie stars, there's no basketball stars, there's no baseball stars. The governor is the height of celebrity in any state, right? So he knows that the influence behind his voice, him telling these girls, they can do whatever they set their minds to, they can. That is a powerful message and because his mother had just died, he was really broken up about this. People around him said that they knew he was sick, and I want this is why I kind of laid the foundation for it. he had an illness for the whole last year, right? The whole last year of his life. But two two weeks before this, when he was about to give his speech, two weeks earlier, his mother had died, and people around him said that they knew that he was distraught over his own health, and um, you know the worries about that. But when his mother died, they could see the physical breakdown in his physical body. Like before they saw that he was mentally anguished over what was happening to him and he was trying to manage it. When his mother died, he, his body started falling apart. People were genuinely really worried. Okay? So he, he was at, this, uh, at the, the Coney Female Academy getting ready to give this speech and someone told him, you need to stop. He said, no, it is my duty. And he wanted to do it for himself and his mother, but he also needed to do it for these girls. So he stood up and he gave the speech and halfway through he almost passed out. Somebody had to sit him down in a chair and they told him, you don't have to, you do not have to keep doing this. Why don't we leave? And he said, no, I'm going to finish. So he finished. He did finish. And right after he was done, he was hurried off to a friend's house nearby. And he died there three days later. He was in and out of a mental um, stupor. He was in and, uh, in and out of consciousness. Um, he... He didn't really seem to suffer all that much. He had a fever and he just, eventually he just, uh, he fell asleep and then he died an hour after he fell asleep the last time. The, the funeral was, he had full military honors at his funeral. Um, his casket was escorted by a company of artillery, um, riflemen and light infantry. Uh, there was a proclamation sent out that was uh, that asked all the businesses in the area to shut down for the day, and they did. Um, flags were flown at half mast, and all of the church bells in town rang from one o'clock in the afternoon until sunset. There were four thousand, over four, slightly over four thousand people in attendance, and um, in today's time, that doesn't sound like a lot. But in 1829, let's, let me put it this way, in 1830, the census said that the population of the city of Augusta, where the funeral was held, right, because he's buried in Capitol Park, the population of the city of Augusta a year later was 3,980. And there were over 4,000 people at his funeral. And you know, not every single person in Augusta was at his funeral. So the city was inundated with people who had come from all over to attend his burial. So he was pretty important. He was recognized as being that important. It was, a, his death was a huge loss to the state of Maine. So that's basically Enoch Lincoln in a nutshell. If you like this video, please 
give us a thumbs up subscribe even and until the next video see you later